Welcome back to ISSR's In Conversation, a discussion series on scholarly topics being worked on by current academics and fellows of the International Society for Science and Religion, ISSR. My name is Anthony Nairn, Executive Assistant of ISSR, and if you're joining with me again, welcome back. And if this is your first time viewing with us, be sure to check out ISSR's channel for more scholarly lectures and conversation. Also, do please hit that like button and subscribe if you enjoy what you've seen, heard, and learned here today. And if you have a topic suggestion for future episodes, please leave a comment below. I'm excited to introduce this conversation to you, as it takes a look at a topic that I think many of us have some cursory awareness of, whether that be from popular culture, the likes of Elon Musk or the late Stephen Hawking, or the news more generally. Political discourse in the United States even has had a past Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, predicate his proposed platform of universal basic income on the coming transition of some jobs in the U.S. market, especially transportation, to autonomous-based labor. Indeed, AI has increasingly occupied a greater share of news and discourse politically, economically, and socially, and will no doubt only become more prevalent as newer and more advanced technologies and methods of machine learning are researched and become more widely available both privately and publicly. An emerging and interesting topic on AI that is often less considered in the public mind for now, and what brings us together now on YouTube, would be AI and religion. This is an increasingly busy intersection of study in the academy today, and ISSR even has a Templeton World Charity Foundation grant to explore this area. So I am excited to bring to you two experts on AI and religion, here to help explain and open up the possible questions that arises from the field of AI and religion, and what it can offer more generally. In conversation for episode two are Dr. Beth Singler. Dr. Singler is the junior research fellow in Artificial Intelligence at Homerton College, University of Cambridge, where she explores the social, ethical, philosophical, and religious implications of advances in artificial intelligence and robotics. Prior to this, she was a postdoctoral research associate on the Human Identity in an Age of Nearly Human Machines project at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, also at Cambridge. She has been an associate fellow at the Louverhum Center for the Center of Intelligence since 2016. Dr. Singler is an experienced social and digital anthropologist, and her first academic book was an in-depth ethnography of the Indigo Children, a new age reconception of both children and adults which uses the language of science, evolution, and spirituality. Dr. Singler also has much by the way of public engagement, and she has produced a series of short documentaries which are available online. The first of these, Pain in the Machine, won the 2017 AHRC Best Research Film of the Year Award. She also has appeared on Radio Force Today, Sunday and Start of the Week programs, discussing AI, robots, and pain. And in 2021, she became a fellow of ISSR. And to discuss AI with Dr. Singler is Professor Robert Grassi. Professor Grassi is a professor of religious studies at Manhattan College in New York City, and is an expert on many subjects related to popular culture generally. Professor Grassi's main interests, however, are the intersection of religion, specifically Hinduism and Christianity, science, and technology. Specifically for our purposes here, his first book, Apocalyptic AI, Visions of Heaven and Robotics, Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality, and his new book coming out this year looking at perspectives on AI in both India and the US, make him uniquely qualified to question AI from different perspectives that may be taken for granted due to their popularity. Using methods from STS, literature studies, ethnography, amongst others, Professor Grassi studies the ways in which technology is a meaning-making enterprise, a reconfiguration of the world to enchant the world and make it purposive. Professor Grassi is also a fellow of the ISSR. As always, links to our speakers will be in the box below, as well to our own website. Please enjoy episode two of ISSR's In Conversation on AI and Religion. So it's really a delight to be here with you today, Beth. Since we met a couple of years ago, back pre-COVID, before the world ended, when <laughs> it felt like, like, I don't know, life 
involved meeting people. And <laughs> we were at a conference on AI and apocalypticism. And we were both keynote speaking there and got a chance to not just hear each other talk about our research, but actually get to know each other and mm-hmm. sit down next to each other at dinner and talk about our mutual love of Dungeons and Dragons uh, <laughs> so that we wouldn't just be talking about robots all the time. But today it's going to be mostly robots, I guess. And I thought it would be a fun way to start the conversation since you're working with Fraser Watts, also with us in the ISSR. Mm-hmm. On a book about religion and AI, like a big one of these big kind of uh, handbooks yeah. thing, right? With <laughs> so could you talk about like your bird's eye view of what's happening mm-hmm. in the study of religion and AI? You know, what really jumps out at you from from that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you say it's a it's a big book. It's what we call the Cambridge Companion, which sounds like something that's going to walk alongside you. And hopefully, for religion and AI scholars, it will be something that they'll have alongside them occasionally to refer to. But I, I think what's really uh, struck me doing this one particular project is just the diversity of approaches to the subject, but also where we're still not entirely have enough space to deal with all that diversity like I feel like there could be a Cambridge University Press there could be several Cambridge companions on religion and AI which is is in itself a kind of controversial statement for some areas of the AI discussion because those two things for some people just don't go together I've been in a lot of AI spaces where Previously, when I was at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, I'd introduce myself and I'd say, I'm looking at science and religion, I'm looking at AI and religion, and there's sort of like shock and horror that these two things can come up in connection with each other. If I could stop you for one moment, I find that really lovely because when you tell people who are not scientists, who are undergraduate students, who are kind of normal people, they immediately jump out with things like, oh, like robots becoming gods or something, right? Like. The normal people seem to leap to this right away. <laughs> so tell us uh, yeah. more about like that reaction on your end with the yeah. So the I've, I mean, I've I've had very specific discussions with uh, nameless, to be unnamed, uh, AI figureheads, uh, AI philosophers, voices in the AI discussion. And like I said, I would introduce myself at the time. I'm not working at the Faraday now, but the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. And the sort of suggestion was, oh, well, you know, those two things don't go together. You might as well, like, think about uh, the religious implications for climate change. I'm like, well, yes, you should. Those two things definitely go together. (laughs) Yeah, those two things go together. Uh, Religion and AI are connected. They're entangled. Um, And thinking through the Cambridge Companion, you know, we were trying to be a Cambridge Companion or a handbook or whatever you want to phrase it as is is slightly closer to a textbook than like a monograph would normally be so it's about covering a field so you know your your chapter we come back with our comments we're like you know we want to hit references and lay out the area of the space of each chapter Um, and in the whole companion we're trying to lay out a lot of what's happening in religion and AI but also like I say we're not going to be exhaustive um and I think what's very interesting for me, from someone who probably studies religion in its more broader abstract sense, but then also digs down into particular instances of religion and AI interaction, is that a lot of the conversation that is known and is discussed tends to come from the kind of Christian perspective. And what we wanted to do, we've, we've only been able to do it to a certain extent in this particular companion and other people will carry on, is to look at other faith traditions and their responses to AI as well, and to keep it as broad as possible. But and there's going to the be meaning, the meaning of religion. Yeah, is tied up in Christianity, right? Uh, exactly. So, you know, I know how I use the word religion, and I have a tendency to define it in a number of the things that I write. What it, for you? What's a guiding like methodological position on what religion is? Yeah, it's it's been really interesting because I came, I came into artificial intelligence more from a sort of new religious studies perspective. That was my PhD was primarily on the new age movement. I did, did a bit of dabbling in writing about uh, Jediism and Scientology, but primarily new age movement. So my conception of religion from, from that beginning point was quite broad, as you say, like there's there's various different ways to approach that. And for a lot of the religion and science discussion in particular, yeah, it comes with this very strong kind of Christian theological background. And then you want to, as we're trying to do with the companion and other people are trying to do as well, to bring in as many different perspectives as possible to say, like, we're not just doing 
Uh, I had someone define religion and science to me as a subject area recently as public theology, but obviously they were meaning public Christian theology. And that's certainly one branch of it. But if, if you're like myself and yourself too, I feel, feel as well, like the anthropological, sociological, historical perspectives on religion and science don't have to be strictly embedded in that Christian theological background. I mean, I wouldn't describe myself at all as a Christian theologian. I just look at what they say. I found, I was writing like a quasi or fake methodology paper a couple of years back. <laughs> and I went looking and I found a website where somebody attempts to, to, to offer as many definitions of religion that this guy had, you know, seen in published spaces. Mm -hmm. And his list, which he was like, this is not a complete list, but it was more than 40 things. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, 40 different definitions of religion. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was funny because my own, though the definition I use wasn't on the list, right? right the definition right. I use comes from David Chittister, mm -hmm. who he says that religion is the negotiation of what it means to be human with respect to the superhuman and the subhuman. So yep. that's a pretty broad conceptualization. Right. And it meant that when I was working on my graduate stuff, you know, back, I think, before you were born. Uh, it was, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I wanted to do a, a, a dissertation on religion, science, and art. Mm -hmm. And I needed a science. And I thought, mm -hmm. robots are cool. Everybody likes robots. And yeah. so I started picking up um, uh, just pop science books about robots, right? So this was back you know, when Moravec and Kurzweil and so forth were writing these things. And I picked up, Hans Moravec was the first person I read. And mm -hmm. I read his book, Mind Children, and I read his book, Robot. And, you know, by my definition, the David Chittister definition of what yeah. religion is, I went, holy smokes, they couldn't have, they're just handing me a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> like, this couldn't yeah. be more religious because you're reading this guy and he's talking about how we're yeah. all going to live forever and we're going to upload our minds and become these transcendent divine kind of robot things. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to say he's wrong because I, I don't know that he's wrong uh, any more than I know that, you know, if, if a Christian tells me when they're dying, they're being yeah. resurrected in the afterlife with Jesus. I don't know that that's right or wrong either. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. that Hans Moravec's right or wrong, but it's definitely <laughs> religious. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's so funny it's, to me that anyone would try to like kind of deny the reality of that space, that there are these huge loud voices and they're really super religious. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that that's, that's accurate. And I think that's, that's how I've approached it a lot of the time is just that definition, I think, works quite broadly. Um, I think also we've, we've got to stay aware that declaring or not declaring something to be a religion is obviously an ideological, political yeah, act. A, a political and move, yeah. It's a political move. Um, so that definition I really like. I think it covers a lot of the space that I'm really interested in. But I have encountered people who push back quite strongly against the use of the word religion because they see that it does harm because they have a pejorative, negative yeah. a, a, a attitude to what religion is and what it can do in the world. So if you start saying some groups are religions when they themselves don't use those words, I've had <laughs> and, that and as a they question. Don't like religious group, like they've set yeah. themselves apart as exactly those people are X Y Z bad for the mm -hmm. following reasons. We're not like them. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that. Diff that's a bit of a minefield I found in exploring this religion and AI space because you want to note where things look like a religion, like it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it feels like a duck. But then if the, that particular community is so antithetical to religion, and some of the th groups I've looked at are really strongly, they talk about religionists and goddists and, you know, uh, people who are sentimental about death and dying because they're transhumanists in some way and they see the, themselves as against that, then, you, yeah, you are, you are in this difficult space, again, with the old not of how do we define religion how do we recognize it when we see it and I I actually said in my notes to you for the for this discussion beforehand because I spoilers we do talk before we end up talking that we could get into this whole we should have though perhaps not perhaps not no it's always nice to chat to you anyway but um this this um this big old problem of how do we re define religion and religion and AI and then we could also do the reverse and say how are we defining AI in AI and religion because that is, a, that is itself a minefield, that the, the things that we tend to look at are the more speculative. And then you'll have like quite serious technological people saying, well, no, that's not really AI. That's just hype. But that's part of the, the whole bundle. Yeah, I have to confess, I kind of cheat on all of this, right? Because if an AI person tells me this is AI, then I go, OK, I'm uh -huh. going to just use your thing here, right? And when I, when I talk about things like Hinduism, 
And there are people who question the categories of religion, question the categories of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. If someone in India tells me that, that they're Hindu, the conversation, I'm, I'm not going to debate whether that person's Hindu, right? Like, yeah. Just yeah. because it's a Western scholar who doesn't like the invention of the term, like there's a person over there who says <laughs> that he's Hindu. Good, granted, right? Yeah. But then on the other hand, I'm in this conundrum where someone who might be a transhumanist says, this isn't religion. Right. And I then say, yes, it is. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. you know, and when I've had these interviews, though, where, where I say, well, I want to talk to you about religion and transhumanism or religion and AI. And I usually have to go to the definition of religion before someone even wants to interview or right. interview with me. You know, yes. they're like, what do you mean by that word? Because, you know, they, they're like, I don't believe in God, so therefore it's not religion or something. Right. right, right, and yeah. frequently people say things like, "Well, religion is about dogmatic faith," and even if that were true, which I don't think it is, <laughs> lots of religions <laughs> are about the things you do, not the things you believe. But even if it were true, there are all these people in the AI space mm -hmm. of all manner of dogmatic faiths about what they think. You know, technology does its role in in human history, mm -hmm. its own self determining nature, yes. uh, progress toward whatever technology envisions that, you know, mm -hmm. the outcome being like, there are all kinds of dogmatic faiths built into technology. And then similarly in AI. Yeah. Of CD. I want, I want to jump in there because you've been, you've been so generous and asked about one of, one of my next books, because I actually have two coming, but one of my next books, I want to ask you about your coming book and you've mentioned Hinduism. Tell oh. me everything there is to know about the book, because I'm going to end up reading it and loving it. I'm sure. Um, well, it'd be great if both of, the, if both of those things happen to be great. <laughs> I can't vouch for, for the, the loving, uh, mm -hmm. only that I enjoyed the writing. Uh, and I can vouch for the cover art, which is spectacular. I saw it. I saw uh, you tweeted it. That's what got yeah, me very excited. Yeah. I, I, uh, had my tattoo artist do the cover art. Nice. It's fabulous. But so what interested me was because a million years ago, I wrote that apocalyptic AI book where I was interested in these people like Moravec and Kurzweil and the kind of religious vision that they were creating. And then, uh, and then in that book, I actually also talk about things like laboratory science. You know, I went to Carnegie Mellon and mm -hmm. talked to some people. And then I talk about legal issues and personhood issues. Nobody seemed to care about any of that. They only cared about the religion side. But, yeah. but then what, when I went to India for my first fieldwork project in 2012, mm -hmm. Uh, I started interviewing scientists and engineers, and there wasn't a huge amount of interest in things like the predictions Ray Kurzweil was making. There was a little bit of interest, and so yeah. I talked about that a little bit in my book, Temples of Modernity, but there were young people who kind of had an interest, and by the time I was back in 2018, 2019, all of a sudden there was a lot more interest, and I think yeah. a lot of that is the influence of things like Netflix, right? If right, you can right. watch on Netflix and, and Amazon, you're watching Black Mirror, yep. you're watching Altered Carbon. All of a sudden, these ideas that were having a hard time percolating through the scientific culture, they moved pretty gracefully through the pop culture. <laughs> yeah. Arena. So there was a lot more interest, and when I people, I had more than one person say to me things like, "Well." do you think Kalki could come as AI? And Kalki is the predicted 10th avatar of Vishnu, yeah. for those yeah. who don't know their Hindu, uh, their Puranas, right? Like Kal <laughs> Vishnu is supposed to come as Kalki to end the degenerate age of the Kali Yuga and mm -hmm. restart the cosmic cycle with a oh, glorious age of such a Yuga. So yeah. all this is you have people telling, ask me like, oh, could Kalki come as an, a robot? I think it could, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I was kind of, it kind of blew my mind. Right, that that just utterly fascinating um, bit of syncretism mm -hmm. that all of a sudden people were starting to think more with more attention to the kinds of promises like uh, those that Kurzweil are making, mm -hmm. and then reconfiguring them. So the purpose of that book is to think about really how it has two purposes. One is how does apocalyptic AI stuff translate into a new context and get reworked. And so there's a fair bit in there about like how the scientific culture, certain translation, there's a lot of history about ideas mm -hmm. in transhumanism, including going back and looking at old stuff from JBS Haldane and so on. Because Haldane lived in India for the last few years of his life. Right. right. And talking to some Indians about Haldane and so forth. And then after kind of working through how is it that Indians are reconfiguring these 
apocalyptic views of uh, AI and robotics. Mm-hmm. I then moved toward the idea that we really need a global conversation about the values we're putting into AI. Yeah. Uh, and that we have to think about kind of religious values as part of that package. Yes. Because we don't want a cultural hegemony. Like, I don't want Ray, Ray Kurzweil might be right. Maybe we're all <laughs> uploading our minds into robots and living forever. That might be true, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't want that to be the only view of AI in, in global culture. That doesn't seem yeah. healthy. We really need to look at what other people have to say. So in the end, I kind of talk about surveillance mm-hmm. AI and how we might think about other kinds of um, some other cultural ideas. So hopefully it all hangs together and the narrative of it makes some kind of sense to people. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure that the narrative direction is my forte. <laughs> 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 what I do. I'm, ju- I'm just thinking, um, I mean, I, I don't know if the dates really work out, but do you think there's any influence from uh, some of the instances, I can't say that word, the examples is maybe an easier word for me to say, examples from Japan where they've they've built robots explicitly described as avatar, whether that, as as a part of the general AI discourse, whether that had, has had any influence. I know it's relatively recently, and you're saying your, your fieldwork starts more in like 2012, but I just wonder, obviously the pop cultural influence is probably the stronger one, but if we've got examples, and it is primarily that example because uh, robotic priests and robotic rabbi don't tend to make those sort of claims because that's not part of the theology, but do you think that's an influence? That, that the I idea? think robotic rabbi could plausibly work. Uh, just oh, because there is one. I mean, there, there is. I mean, there's a... but, but, I, yeah. but I think you're actually uh, definitely onto something because not just were these Japanese religious robots, mm. you know, making headlines, right? They yes. were making headlines. Yeah. Tons of people are watching them on YouTube. Uh, in Germany, that Bless You Too robot yep. made headlines all over the world. And also in what didn't get as much international press, but in India, there was a robot performing arti for Ganesha. That's where it, Mm -hmm. you know, holds the the flame. Yeah. And in India, that got a lot of publicity Mm -hmm. in the, in the kind of newspaper reading, internet reading community. So Mm -hmm. as part of that package, I think you're right that people have seen these, these robots that have a kind of religious purpose. Yeah. Even religious names, you know, when you call it yeah, yeah. or whatever. And, and you know, the, the Buddhist funerary robots. Mm-hmm. And then you've got this bless you too thing, which is really yeah. weird. Uh, and then I, even, I use the bless you too robot in a lot of talks because there's a great gif where you can just see how its hands yeah. light up. <laughs> like a blessing is a good. I mean, I think actually if you look into that one a bit, I mean, they're quite clear. And this is, this is true more of kind of uh, Protestant traditions, uh, Christian Protestant traditions, that they're very clear that these are not meant to replace priests. They're yeah. not, again, with like the Church of England Alexa skill that you can download that says the Lord's Prayer. They're not meant to pray for you. So it's different, I suppose. What I'm pointing more to is the cases where someone has built a specific robot and said, this is the avatar of yeah. and again you can talk about hype and that's that story as well but if if you are of a faith tradition that allows for physical manifestations of your deities like hinduism like buddhism that that distinction isn't so strong like the distinction between the robot priest which is an yeah. example to get a conversation started like bless you too robot was yeah. about talking about the future of work and automation versus like this is actually something that's theologically possible in our in our understanding of the world. That's different. So I wonder if that's what's had the influence. Yeah, well, just to be kind of like obnoxiously academic, it goes back to those kinds of things about how we define religion, right? Yes. Because you referred, for example, to faith traditions. Mm. Not every religion is about faith. Right? True, true. So, you know, and, and, and in particular, if you, if you can disambiguate belief a little bit, mm-hmm. then a robot that does the right thing Mm-hmm. Is doing the right thing. Yeah. So stop, yeah. right? If it if it's if it's doing the right thing. So it would be hard to see that in say Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Not impossible. I, I, I don't rule out any of this. When people tell me things like <laughs> a robot could never have a soul or something yeah. like that, mm-hmm. I say, look, I don't know that I have a soul. I don't know that you have a soul. You <laughs> yes. can't the only guy who tried to like kind of prove that was the guy who was weighing dead people, you know, people who yes, were dying. Yeah, yeah. Right? to try to prove that <laughs> they gave up their souls upon death. Like, right. so we can't prove that we have souls. And if the origin of souls is some one or more gods out there, 
yeah. I don't see why they can't put souls in robots too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, and- I had a similar sort of conversation with some uh, scientists who were Christian. So I'm not going to say Christian scientists because that's something separate, but <laughs> scientists who were Christians. Let's not muddle that too much. Um, but I, you yeah, know, the, the standard argument, God can do whatever God wants to do. So they were very adamant in this conversation that robots would never have souls. And I said, if you, you start from the, the, the base assumption that God can do whatever God wants to do, then why not? Like that's, yeah, I think they were, they were perhaps thinking more in terms, I mean, yeah, there's another thing going back very quickly to the Cambridge Companion. And of course we've got a few theological chapters and how, predominant discussion of Imago Dei is specifically in those chapters that this seems to be the touchstone for most of the conversations from a Christian or, you know, uh, yeah, primarily Christian perspectives of different flavors about AI and robots, that it's all about how we fit AI and robots into this line of creation and whether you get into like co-creation ideas from first and other people. But again, this is this repeating pattern. So again, if you think God can create man, kind humankind oh my god did i say that mankind oh my god um we can create humankind i'm so ashamed it's like saying faith traditions a minute ago um then why not but well and you know if i could also i want to say something about that cambridge companion also because you and fraser were kind enough to invite me to participate in that and in writing a an essay on hinduism and ai because of the nature of my work i then asked my friend to join me because he knows Hindu philosophical traditions yeah. back and, and, and forth. So we, we collaborated our different kind of approaches. But one of the arguments we had was the corollary of this. When he said right. to me, a robot can't be conscious. And I said, what do right. you, and this is in a very specific Hindu sense of consciousness. Not yeah. he mean intelligent. Like in, in Hindu philosophy, there's a separation between what is conscious and what is intelligent. So he said the machine can be intelligent, but it can't be conscious because right. consciousness is this fundamental nature of reality. And it, it instantiates as a human. And okay. I said, why can't it instantiate as a robot? And he said, well, yeah. it just wouldn't or whatever. And I said, well, hold on a moment. What if the robot were way better at being at thinking about the world and, and doing all the things in the world and earning good karma? Yes. So if you could earn good karma as a robot and better than a human could, why wouldn't you want to instantiate your consciousness as a robot? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we, we had this wonderful argument. And in the end, we were like, well, yeah. currently, if you asked, you know, someone, you know, a philosopher in the Hindu fold, that person would probably say, no, consciousness is not generally born into robots. Yeah. But there's no, just as a soul might come in, you know, in the Christian yeah. context, God's could, God could put a, a, a soul in a robot because it's the God's prerogative or whatever. Exactly. Uh, I feel like that's a, a kind of weird open door that we have that our, our kind of chauvinist <laughs> prejudice that says human beings have got to be more awesome than the robots in X, Y, Z fashion. Those usually run afoul of the very theologies that we're trying to defend with that claim. It's, I think it's, it's interesting because there, there is this very strong, like you say, well, chauvinism, human essentialism in l- many religions, they are focused around human identity, human flourishing, uh, flourishing humanity as the center of the universe, whatever the stages of scientific progress that have taken us away from that view. But um, I think what was quite interesting to me, a few years back, also pre the end days that we currently live in, when we used to meet up for big events, we had at the union here in Cambridge, we had a big, a, a big debate about what is special about the human in relation to AI. And I think the, uh, I forget which side which was which, but the side that said there's nothing special, specific about humans, were really set up to try and defeat a spiritual argument from the other side. They were like, they were absolutely certain in everything they argued that the other side who were saying that, yes, there is something special about humans would do with some sort of argument about the soul, some sort of God argument, religiosity, and they didn't do that. So they completely failed because they had nothing to argue you against because the other side who said yes humans are special did it purely on the basis of evolution and um you know, how we build society and civilizations and yes ai can do a few of these things but not collectively and not with any kind of epiphenomenon of what happens when civilizations occur and i find that i found that fascinating that the assumption that human essentialism equals some form of religion that equals yeah. the some sort of argument that's, about the that's soul super interesting yeah, it was okay. completely the the other perspective on what you're talking about there. That from a religious perspective, only the humans could be special, but actually you don't yeah. need that religious perspective. 
if I could go back to something you just brought up, the question mm. of human flourish, that's one that's really, really important to me because I, again, try to be agnostic on exactly what's going to happen with robots, right? Yeah, Are right. they going to be human equivalent? Are they going to be greater than human yes. equivalent? I don't know. But right. one way or the other, I think our technology should be about human flourishing, right? And, right. But not just humanity. I, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been a save the manatees guy since literally the sixth grade. So cute. Right? I, I, I really think we should be looking after the natural world in yes. ways that we're not. Which is, of course, why I think religion and climate change is a topic that's worth engaging. But yes. I also, for that same reason, that's where the religion and AI thing matters, right? Mm -hmm. If we're concerned with human flourishing, whether or not the machines are going to be super smart, mm -hmm. then we have to be concerned about the ethics and values that go into the developmental process, right? how it is we fund these things, how it is we design them, and how do we deploy them. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, religious voices can matter there. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and get involved in that conversation. So then going back to that first thing you said where the AI people were like, well, I don't even know what <laughs> <laughs> I, know, and I think why, at that specific right? point, um, it was about a month before Trump was elected president. <laughs> and I felt there was a big conversation. It was it was at a conference in America. There was already a big conversation about Trump's links to very hard right evangelical Christians and their views on dominionism and his views on capitalism and we need to use the world's resources because if we don't the other guys will and blah, all that stuff and it felt like this was absolutely a space where already the conversation about religion was happening but then you I brought it up in regards to AI and it's like well no because the assumption again is like it would only be the very uh hard right versions of religion that would have impact so we don't want that part of the conversation it's like there's no when you when I encounter that sort of view there's no understanding of the wealth and richness of religious philosophy it's purely about well we don't want dogma like you say we don't want doctrine we don't want hard things being implemented so there's a wonderful short story that I refer to sometimes in some of my work uh, from Zoltan Istvan who was the transhumanist candidate for president in America a few years back and he's still he was he's a candidate for president well, okay independent he was you know, running to a certain degree um, and he's doing great interesting philosophical things now but he wrote a short story for motherboard a while back which was called the Jesus singularity which just had this uh kind of B-movie plot of a scientist, an atheist scientist developing a super AI about ready to turn it on when the current president dies and his vice president, who's a, a strong Christian evangelical, becomes president in his place and he insists that this new super AI will be fed the Bible. As though that's the thing, you just feed the AI the Bible and that will give it morality. And then, of course, they do that. The scientist doesn't want to because he's, he's an atheist, but they do that and they turn it on and it goes crazy and it destroys the world with nukes. So there's this uh, very shorthanded version of if we put religious values into our conversation, not even like feeding the Bible to the AI, but if we put the values into our conversation, then it's going to lead to these kinds of disasters because that's the assumption about the detrimental effects of religion rather than recognizing that if we're going to have a discussion about human flourishing, that there might be something valuable said from thousands of years of discussing it from a religious perspective. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is human beings aren't always great at exercising yeah. the values that we, you know, that, that matter to us. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't want to talk about religious values, or you be talking about the values of capitalism, mm -hmm. I mean, those might be great in some fashion, but they're certainly not doing wonders. <laughs> consumer capitalism is not doing wonders for the earth, right? right? And and I doubt that if we want to make consumer capitalism the overriding value of AI development, that we're going in a super good direction, right? Like we need to think about what are, how do we protect people? What do people need? And that can't all come from one side of the conversation. It certainly can't come if we're just going to like push religious people off to the side and say, we don't care what you think. Yeah. Because sometimes, as you say, they've spent their, you know, they've spent somewhere between 500 and 3000 years thinking yeah. about the values or 4000 <laughs> years, really thinking about but, the yeah. values that matter to them mm -hmm. and even if they're not good at employing them all the time because mm -hmm. none of us are good at employing them all the time no. <laughs> we still can think about it right and think about what is it that any given you know community might have to offer and hopefully that i you know for me it's the divide between policy and uh, the the academic value conversation that's so hard to get across, right? Yeah. Because yeah. even if you sit around and you all go, okay, we want to take a say Hindu 
value Swaraj, meaning self-reliance and self-mastery, mm-hmm. right? Self-mastery, really, self-control. Uh, if we want our AI technologies to give me self-control instead of not me, my ability to control you, but mm-hmm. me, my ability to protect myself, let's make that our goal, right? Mm-hmm. Even if that's our goal, how do we then get Google to care about that goal? How do we get the U.S. government to care about that goal, right? Yeah. Like, how do we move from a good goal? I think most people would agree that, for example, would be a pretty good goal. Mm-hmm. How would we move it into industrial policy and into government policy? Yeah. I, I, I have no clues. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping you're not expecting a decent answer from me on that one because I think it's very difficult as well. I think um, the the policy spaces that I've occasionally, not very often, but occasionally been asked into, they can sound very interested, but then it <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do anything with it. Um, so I, I have spoken at a, a couple of large well, pretty large tech companies in a small way. Like I haven't spoken to the entirety of the company, but I've spoken to a small group within a large, well-known tech company a few times. And I've spoken to policymakers here in the UK and and other places as well. And, And I think to a certain extent, the arts and humanities conversation, let's broaden it from religious studies for a second. The arts and humanities conversation, they find fascinating, but it's like telling them a story about stories and then they move on. <laughs> so it's it's difficult because it seems like there's an appetite and there's enthusiasm. But when they conceptualize AI ethics as a field, it doesn't necessarily involve all that muddledness that arts and humanities scholars are good at describing and not necessarily coming up with a solution for the complexities of it, because that's just the way things are. But they want something that's neatly bound with a bow that they can call AI ethics. And sometimes because they want that kind of very reduced product, they yeah. don't encapsulate all those things that we're talking about. But and it becomes they epic. actually create their own horrible muddles, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, to, to pick on uh, poor Google, oh, their poor first Google. effort at an AI ethics board imploded almost immediately yes. because of the ridiculous constitution of the board, right? Like right. you can't put a guy who's like in charge of a military robotics company on your mm. ethics board and expect a reasonable debate about the ethics of military AI, right? Like you yeah. can't do it that way. So they first right. create this one board. It totally implodes under <laughs> under outside pressure. And yeah. then they start hiring people into AI ethics. And then that totally implodes, right? Yes. With the firing of Tim right. Chibru. And then, yeah. and then um, is it Margaret Mitchell? Who Melanie. Melanie Mitchell. Okay. Um, you know, the... Like all of a sudden, these these key figures in their AI ethics conversation get fired, yeah. And, yeah. and they look terrible again, right? And so the companies, in as they're engaged in this process, they create their own frustrating models because of this very issue that they're not yeah. comfortable with the complexity of the conversation, and not necessarily welcoming of the voices that are that are complexifying it, right? That are saying. Yeah we have a race problem or we have a gender problem or yeah. we have like this X, Y, Z value problem. And then once you come to the table with that, they're like, well, that's not quite what we wanted, but we right. wanted was like our ethics <laughs> shield. <laughs> like, yeah. We want a force field. Called <laughs> um, I think that's that. I think it is in part our job as academics. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a responsibility there. We have things like, you know, uh, you know, in the U.S. tenure systems that protect freedom of speech and so forth. And we have to be able to say, that's not the right answer. Yeah. Right? Did, did we have to do this better mm-hmm. and get involved better, right, and, and create better systems. Mm. I'm not sure how much I'm doing that by talking about people who want to upload their minds into robots. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> I think it's... Principle. <laughs> Yeah. So that's, I guess, what's partly what I'm saying when I, I say if I've given talks that have dealt with that to tech companies, they go, well, that's nice, but that's that's the crazy people. That's not us. But it's it's part, that's how they're saying it, not me. Um, but it feels like it's part of the same conversation, like the telos of technology, the technological determinism that they're all sharing in, whether they're deciding they're going to upload their brains at some point, or they're just deciding that the best way to deal with um role hearings is to implement artificial intelligence is part of the same argument that there is a better way of doing things through technology 
Um, and if it's dealing with the pernicious problem of death or it's the pernicious problem of humans being humans, they think in similar <laughs> directions. Um, so I think it is valuable, certainly, to keep an eye on what they might think of the general conversation about AI I might think of as transhumanism as being fringe because it's all part of the same thing. But the, the blurring, it's not a dichotomy either. It's a blurred line where Elon Musk can be very, very keen on automated vehicles as a solution to various problems, but also in uploading our minds. Like that Neuralink, the connections there that he's trying to draw out, these are all on a spectrum of advancements that see our future as being a particular thing and also being on Mars, which I have big problems with. But, you know, that's slightly out, perhaps outside the remit of religion and AI, but I don't know. <laughs> religion and exoplanets is a whole field too. Yeah. I do like the idea of human beings being able to explore the cosmos or whatever, but I like better the idea of the earth being a livable place. Yeah. And I would rather yeah. our investment were on how are we going to live comfortably here? But the yeah. crazy thing is this goes back to what you were just saying in technological determinism. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love David Noble's book on this, Religion and Technology, where he really picks apart this idea that we think We've just taken God out of the picture, right? Like it, once upon a time, God had a plan and yeah. the world was moving to wherever it was going in, in Christian, you know, the Christian Europe and North America, right? This idea right. that God had a plan. And then we kind of pulled that out and we just decided technology had a plan. Right? <laughs> the technology itself is just doing its own thing and it's going in these wonderful, like, and so it's both. Sure, it created a problem, but it's going to solve it because it's yeah. totally on the way to solving it. Of you course. know, it's, we're going to magically clean up the environment because technology will just do yeah. that. We're going to have cooler technologies, you know, <laughs> and and we're going to live forever and we're going to satisfy all those old religious goals, you know, hooray for technology in, mm -hmm. in one way, shape or form. And Elon Musk is a great example. He's got all of the technologies, right? He's, right. He's, you know, I guess he's not really, as far as I'm aware, in the genetic engineering space, but yeah, in the not space, that I've heard. space yeah. the robotics and AI space, mm -hmm. the cyborg human bioengineering space, like yeah. all these things where people are like, well, that's the solution to our future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you know, that's our, that's our goal. And if it's not Elon Musk, then it's someone else, right? Just right. magically the technology will do that. And mm -hmm. I do take that to be a very pernicious attitude, mm -hmm. the belief that human beings don't have meaningful choice in this process, but that technology is just going to unfold its way along and we're here for the ride. I mean, that's yeah. a crazy idea, right? And that's one of the reasons we have to talk about things like value systems. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why the religion and AI conversation is worthwhile is you go, wait, hold on. Human choice matters. We can look at the history yeah. of science and technology and we can demonstrate ways in which human choice matters. And now let's talk about what kind of choices we want to make. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the time uh, the counter argument is very dismissively described as some form of like neo Ludditism. And I, I, I have to I have a couple of times bitten my tongue because the Luddites were right in a specific sense like they they weren't they weren't ever claiming that all technology is bad they were working in factories where factory technology was not. replacing them <laughs> so they were right but you if you sometimes you try and develop this counter argument of saying well you know there's no technological determinism we're doing what we want to do we can decide not to do these things that's the accusation that gets flung at you that you're some form of luddite and that's that's bad in some way yeah, when instead the goal is, okay, let's figure out, you know, how we're going to make sure that the people who get disemployed, for example, have a living, you know, yeah. you know, how are we going to do that? How are we going to make sure the technologies are fairly uh, shared by people of different nations, skin yeah. tones, et cetera, right? Like, that's how we have to have that conversation. Um and I think, uh, I think uh, on the questions, you, we sent questions to each other beforehand, and I'm just, I'm just quickly going, one of the things you asked was, what's the most pressing thing for you when starting thinking of AI? And it's that, that level of distinct inequality that I always use my favorite Gibson quote, William Gibson, who said, like, the future's already here, it's just unequally distributed. So this is something I feel like religious scholars who are practiced in commenting on society and civilization and change and connections between humans to actually indicate and point towards these things and saying these are moments where this is happening. And yes, you can, you can also throw in um, theological responses if that's your bag. It's not mine particularly, but liberation theology might have something to say 
about uh, the widespread results of inequality through capitalism that's being accelerated by automated and decision-making systems. So I think that's that's the area, if, uh, if we want to talk about most pressing issues, although I, I tend to talk more in my academic writing about some of these more speculative ideas, I think because they are distracting from the near present. So, so much. let's parse those two things out. One, what yeah. we know to be really politically important, right? How are we going to create a just world? Right, that's political. Mm-hmm. But then we also have our, our own little academic curiosities, the things that we pursue just because they're interesting to us. Right. Um, for you, what is the kind of scholarship in religion and AI that you want to see? What do you mm-hmm. want to do? And what do you want, what do you want other people to do? Because none of us can do it all, right? So yeah. <laughs> what's exciting to you as a like looking to the future? So I would like to have the last two to three years back from COVID to have been able to, like so many of us, to have been able to do more ethnographic field work. So I've done digital ethnography and I've moved a little bit more into considering film and literature, which is always a passion of mine anyway, but I've done a little bit more of that in the last couple of years. But I think what's really necessary in this space is a direct case study work that actually looks at instances is where we have these, I generally call them entanglements, but you can also talk about clashes and tension points between religion and AI or even supporting moments. Um, I like your entanglements better because that's I do. That I like entanglements. Judge it as being exactly. good or bad. I get that from um, Courtney Bender's work on uh, the New Age movement. So I've been using it from her since about 2011, 2012 ish, when I started my postgrad studies looking more at the New Age movement. And I think it's, it's, she's talking about the entanglements of spirituality and society. And she uses specific examples of New Age groups and how they uh, interact with institutions. So I'm I'm broadening it in the sense of uh, technology and spirituality and then AI and religion. But I think you're right. It's it's a very useful neutral term because it doesn't it doesn't posit either conflict or support, but we can find examples of both. And another thing, um, that kind of case study ethnographic approach needs to be more comprehensive. So that's where it goes beyond what I'm capable of doing. But I want to see a and there are people, obviously, but a, a more networked sense of who are the people who are out there looking at these entanglements. Are they very specific, small case studies, or are they doing something larger with more abstract senses of religion and AI and like getting people together? You know, like most academics, we just want to get people together without the kind of limitations of just, oh, we held a nice conference once a year and nothing really changed or happened out of that. Or we, you know, I say this as someone who's working on an edited volume, but we published an edited volume about this subject and then we moved on to the next research grant. I mean, there needs to be an ongoing continuous conversation and there's certainly lots of people involved already. Yeah, I didn't realize that you and I were so aligned on the question of ethnographic work Hmm. um, because I also think that what we need are like all kinds of interesting case studies. I was talking to a young scholar who was thinking about how he could do his PhD work and He's from, uh, he was living in Europe, but was from a developing nation and has family there and speaks the language. And I said, man, I don't know anybody who's talked anything at all. You know, he wanted to do a thing about religion and AI. I was like, nobody's done that there. Yeah. Now, it may be that there are a lot of people who aren't thinking about AI at all, right? You know, if you're living, you know, some people are living with a subsistence economy. They don't have time Mm -hmm. to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but there are other people in that country who certainly these are these are issues that might be relevant to them. So that would be a really great project. You want a PhD project? Go back to that yeah. country yeah. And, <laughs> and talk to people and and tell us all something we don't know, because there's a great big world. And if everybody's going to keep talking about the same things that are all Euro-American, mm. we're not making much progress. Yeah. When. But of course, each one of us can only be, you know, in one place at a time. And so wherever your own expertise and your own funding, and I'd sure like to see some more symmetrical funding. I think it would be great Mm -hmm. to pay people to come from, you know, developing nations to do ethnographic work in the U.S. And so, but like, you know, why on earth do we get to be the special people who tell you what you're doing and thinking in your country? Because people could come here and tell us, what we're doing and thinking 
and yeah. change the way we understand ourselves, right? Absolutely. So I, I mean, that's I mean, that's that, that's a product that obviously a product of the history of anthropology, right? That we had this idea you have to you have to be the white Western person going somewhere else to examine and then slowly we start thinking about well we should examine ourselves and again ourselves being white western block group but yeah i think that symmetrical idea is really interesting because we we are blind to our own biases and privileges and understandings of things that we actually do need that fresher perspective from someone who doesn't come from exactly the same culture as us i think that's a really useful approach so okay so right so we will set up a vast network of ethnographers who are looking at this, and we will have lots of money to be able to do that. Yeah, how do we convince Elon Musk that a big part of his project <laughs> should be the funding of this network? <laughs> that it's not just brain-computer interfaces, it's also anthropological interfaces. And yeah. all we need is a small fraction of his shares in Tesla to, <laughs> to enact this new vision. Yeah, that's that's the key key problem in academia. But uh, we need we need lots more uh, benevolent billionaires. But I don't know very many. Well, and we need actually a different way for governments to think about this because our mm. the U.S. government, for example, is interested in things like AI ethics. They're they're interested in AI. Yes. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the amount of you know NSF money, the National Science Foundation, the money that goes toward uh, like concrete program efforts. Mm -hmm exceeds by what like five to ten orders of magnitude mm -hmm. the, you know the amount of money that would go to people actually thinking about the ethics of these these mm -hmm. projects and yeah. often when there's an ethics component what you have is a roboticist who's going to talk about the ethics of it right. like hold on if i apply to the nsf and i say i have this robot project i want to get involved with they're going to say you're not a roboticist yes. Why are you building yeah. robots yeah. And yet, if a roboticist says, oh, one third of our project is about ethics, yeah. they're not obliged to bring in the ethics, whatever that ethics person would be, right? I'm not yes. defining what that would mean, um, but they're not obliged to get outside expertise. So we also need to think yeah. about government funding and how it is that government funding could create a more robust conversation around what we want as a community right. and how we're going to go about getting it. I see this as well because, I mean, I think I've told you this thing, you know, I'm job hunting, lots of fun, and uh, I'm going for jobs around that sort of space if possible. Uh, I'm staying in academia if possible or whatever, but um, I looked at an AI ethics job the other day, a lectureship in a university, and they, they only wanted computer scientists and data scientists. <laughs> no. not, not even I mean usually I'll, I'll accept yeah okay they want philosophers and I'm not a philosopher I sometimes do philosophical anthropology but not very much um but no just computer scientists and data scientists I'm like, well wow. how does that help that conversation how does that help that conversation grow and you need that too right because you need to be able to code in whatever kind of values you're trying to create but you've got to feed the <laughs> thing the bible right you've got to feed it in <laughs> feed See, it right I'm, in there I like this because my mother was uh, what you would originally have called a computer programmer in the sense that she was physically lifting index cards and yeah, placing yeah. them into a drawer that went into a massive mainframe. She used to work at IBM. It's where she met my dad, who was a computer salesman. So I'm kind of like a product of IBM, which is quite fun. Um, but yeah, there's this feeling of like lifting and putting something in is not how it works really but the the, the <laughs> dotted card thing sticks in my head so when you say like feed the bible in well but you actually hear people sometimes say that about human beings i mean i've right. seen people say things like i want to feed in truth to my kid right. like and it's a big capital t truth yes. right and i'm like what well, that's a really odd thing to mm. say I mean, even if you knew what the capital T truth was, which you don't, um, you know, you can't feed it into your kid, right? Like this. Uh, even though you could probably more easily do that than a computer. Um, but either way, you really yeah. have the right sense for how we encode values into people or machines. I've I've been thinking about this lately because I ha I have a ten year old son and you you do so often see this parallel made between the metaphor of the AI as child that we have to educate the AI as it develops the AI often as well in, in the discourse it's like framed as singular which is not entirely a, a tr true at all but in conversations with my son lately I'm very very struck and aware of how little I know and just trying to explain the current 
invasion in Ukraine to my son, who in the conversation at his school, 10 year olds, they're talking about World War Three. And I'm trying to explain things as I understand them to a 10 year old and adjusting the truth in that I'm not lying to him, but I'm adjusting the truth to a level that he can understand to then presume that we can have an unadjusted truth that's digestible to all forms of both people and if we're speculating on AI as well, just it pushes that metaphor to breaking point because it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't identify the difficulty of the practicalities of actually teaching our children. So or obviously- even, their, even their own internal process because mm. I remember, you know, there's a quote attributed to Swami Vivekananda, the famous um, kind of popularizer of Hinduism in the West around the turn of the 20th century, uh, who said, you cannot raise a child any more than you can grow a plant. Right. Yeah. What I take that to mean is you can create mm-hmm. an environment for a plant to grow in, but the mm-hmm. plant does its own work, right? It yeah. grows, <laughs> uh, it does that. All you provided mm. was soil and nutrition and sunlight and so forth. And the child's going to do its thing within the context of what you what you can control. Mm-hmm. And likewise, if we're really interested in what our machines are going to do, we ought to be thinking about, like, we can't feed into them <laughs> whatever we want, yeah. but we can potentially create an environment that that improves the odds of us getting where we want to go. Yeah. Which is why, again, I think the parent-child narrative in artificial intelligence discourse is so interesting because it does explain some where some of our fears come from because we have this... I think we have this moment and anthropologists of childhood and parenting have written about this, this moment of realization that, we're, like, as you say, we're producing something that grows on its own, that becomes its own individual. I'm talking about children, but then that, that concern and fear we feel as parents when we realize that we've created a new subjectivity, we map onto our discussions about artificial intelligence. And that's where a lot of the dystopian stuff comes from, because we think something that grows and develops on its own, oh no, it will go crazy it will go destructive um and so the the parental fears that we have and it's not all the time obviously but the parental fears that we have concerns we have that seems to replicate itself out into the the narratives and the stories that we tell about ai as well and unfortunately we do have evidence that there are structures and systems that we have allowed to kind of grow without us caring much about Mm -hmm. their values and they've grown into terrible you know we have (laughs) political and economic catastrophes left and right, in part mm-hmm. because we haven't been very conscientious. And right. this religion and AI conversation, um, there is an organization called AI and Faith, for example, that wants to take you know, these different religious traditions and think about how um, different communities should be part of the conversation. And mm-hmm. I take that as really important work. Um, but we have to think about what is the environment that we want AI to develop in? And, you know, I asked my students yesterday, I said, where, like, let's just pretend like transcendent, wonderful, godlike machines are coming. Where, where is the AI development coming from? And they had Mm -hmm. done some reading on things and they, you know, they immediately said from, from big corporations. And I said, okay, so what's the goal of a big corporation? And they Mm -hmm. said, well, to make money. Okay. So is what we really need in life, super smart machines that that are super good at making money. And they're like, eh. And then I said, (laughs) where else are they going to come from? They said government and and military is a subset of government. I said, what's the purpose of a government? And they said, well, it controls people. And I said, okay, so it's what we really (laughs) want are super, super smart robots that are great at controlling people, (laughs) you know, and, and, you know, we still haven't figured out what is the context in which we mm-hmm. want this development to really occur, but the context as it's presently occurring, most people would recognize as, as you know, potentially disastrous. So yeah. we really need to build that conversation and figure out how we draw in the public, how we draw in, you know, people from different religious communities, but mm-hmm. also from political communities and, and corporate communities. Cause I do think a lot yeah. of people want to do the right thing. It's just always harder to do the right. It's that muddle you talked about earlier, yeah. right? The, the hard, the, it's hard to do the right thing sometimes in these really <laughs> complex conversations. I think, yeah, I think part, part of what you were describing there is that the, the, the current context of where we're developing AI and, and we decide, you know, it's government run, that sounds like a bad idea, corporate. And it reminds me of this British joke, I don't know if it exists anywhere else, about the, the guy gets lost in the countryside and he, he finally comes across this farmer 
And he's, he's, oh, you know, I've really got to get to the train station, say. I've got to get to the train station. And the farmer gives him, oh, okay, you go down the lane, you go left, you go right, you go left, you go right, right. And he gives him this long spiel of directions. And he says, oh, really? Is there no quicker way to get to the train station? And he says, well, you just don't start from here. So we, we've got... <laughs> The irony of like, you just, we want to kind of restart everything that we've already done in the lead up to artificial intelligence. And unfortunately, so that's not an option. We're it's not an option. We're going to wind our way through the complicated um, mm. path. But it, it's great if, uh, let's say we're the farmers at least, and hopefully giving clear instructions and directions, or we're thinking about the necessity of the directions that we're going in, right? Maybe, so the farmer, maybe, to extend the metaphor. to walk someone along the way. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Or the, the farmer there, knows where there's, there's a pond you don't want to go straight through if you're following your GPS, which has got some really low-rent artificial intelligence system that's sending you through a pond. Like, maybe we think about what's happening on the path as we go as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's about our hour and it feels like a really good place to finish up. So right. thanks for joining in the little conversation and thanks to Anthony for setting it up for us and, and hosting us. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's been a, it's, for me, it's a really great, useful chat and I'm always really fascinated what you're up to. I was reading apocalyptic AI when I started out in this area and I felt like I, I want to carry on following what you're up to as much as possible. Well, make sure when your new book comes out that I know all about it. I mean, I expect I will anyway. But <laughs> well, don't out of your be... out of your kind of public outreach to people. To <laughs> oh, the way I annoy library. people online. <laughs> all right, Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much.